After being criticized by NASA for moving too slowly and even facing the risk of losing its Artemis 3 contract, SpaceX is now pushing harder than ever. Launch Pad 1 was quickly taken apart right after Flight 11 to be upgraded for the upcoming Starship V3. Over at Pad 2, testing activities are ramping up rapidly signaling that it's getting close to full operation. Meanwhile, construction at Gigabay has kicked into overdrive, and at LC-39A, a massive new structure almost like a giant warehouse is about to be installed. Things at SpaceX have never been this energetic. So, how is SpaceX gearing up to kick off the brand new Starship era? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech. It's the end of an era. Launch Pad 1. The legendary site that hosted 11 Starship launches is reaching the final chapter of its life. The familiar six-legged OLM, the roaring water deluge system, the towering Mechazilla arms, and all those massive fuel lines are now being dismantled. Not because they failed, but because SpaceX is moving on. The pad still works perfectly fine and could easily handle dozens more flights, but it's being retired to make way for progress, the transition from Starship V2 to Starship V3. These massive structures simply weren't built to meet the technical demands of the next generation vehicle. First, let's take a look at the massive structure rising at Starbase the Gigabay. This will be the heart of Starship production in the future, where the most advanced Starships will be built. Over the past week, steel columns and beams have been going up non-stop, marking major progress on Crane Tower 4 and the main frame of the building. This is just the beginning. The structure is expected to rise to around 116 meters once completed. After the main steel skeleton is in place, SpaceX will move on to installing crossbeams and horizontal supports to strengthen the frame, followed by roofing and wall panels made of steel sheets, glass, and insulation materials to protect the interior from Florida's harsh weather. Inside the team will install lighting ventilation and safety systems, as well as office and meeting spaces on the upper floors. The entire construction process is estimated to take 12 to 18 months, depending on the build speed and technical challenges. But given SpaceX's track record, they've built dozens of massive facilities already. It likely won't take that long. Once complete, the Gigabay will enable SpaceX to ramp up production dramatically from one Starship per week, eventually to one per day, just as Elon Musk once envisioned. Now. Let's move the tank farm, where crews have already ripped out critical ground support hardware. They sacrificed two basket strainers, three valve assemblies, and the subcooler inlet manifold, all essential parts of the fueling system that once kept Starship flying. The basket strainers filtered out debris and impurities in the fuel lines, protecting pumps and valves from damage. The valve assemblies controlled the flow of methane and liquid oxygen during tanking operations, while the subcooler inlet manifold distributed ultra-chilled liquid oxygen from the cooling units into the storage and transfer system. Together, these components formed the backbone of Pad 1's propellant supply chain. Now, they were gone, lifted away by cranes one after another, part of a fast, no-nonsense demolition campaign that began right after Flight 11. The reason behind all this removal is simple restructuring the entire cryogenic pipeline system. Starship V3 will need a much faster propellant flow rate, up to 5, 500 to 6,000 tons per hour. So the old setup just isn't enough anymore. To handle that, SpaceX is introducing a new quick swap GSE module design. Instead of being permanently welded in place key components like valves, filters and manifolds are now mounted on mobile skids which can be swapped out in just 24 to 48 hours. It's a smarter, faster, and much more flexible system. This upgrade also ties directly into SpaceX's plan to run Pad 1 and Pad 2 in parallel. Removing the old GSE is just the first step in mirroring Pad 2, so both launch pads can operate interchangeably using the same shared tank farm without needing any major reconfiguration between flights. Speaking of Launch Pad 1, major changes are already clearly visible, especially the orbital launch mount. Last week, crews started peeling away those big steel shields around it. Plasma torches have been running almost non-stop, cutting through the shielding, and those thick deck plates on top of the OLM ring. Bit by bit, they're exposing all the fuel lines inside so they can pull everything out. It's a slow job. The OLM's internal structure is insanely complex. They'll need a few more weeks to strip it down, make it lighter, and then start taking it apart, piece by piece, the ring, the six legs, the cooling system under the mount, 
even the deluge setup. All of this is to clear space for a brand new OLM, complete with a flame trench. So, why go through all this trouble? Because Starship V3 is on a whole new level. Its heavier runs on upgraded Raptor 3 engines and produces around 10,000 tons of thrust. That's an enormous amount of power. At ignition, the exhaust can reach 3,500 dixir uh, hot enough to melt steel in seconds. The old OLM simply couldn't handle that the heat and acoustic shock alone could destroy piping valves, even the booster QD. The new setup with a deeper and wider flame trench, about 30 by 10 meters, will channel that plasma away from the pad, protecting everything around it. If the old pad was good for maybe 50 flights before needing a rebuild, this new one could go 10 times longer. Right above the OLM sits Mechazilla, and its massive catching arms, better known as the chopsticks, have recently caught everyone's attention. They've been marked with white paint lines, which likely means SpaceX isn't removing them completely, but rather cutting them shorter. From what it looks like, SpaceX might be planning to shorten Mechazilla's chopsticks from about 2 meters down to roughly 18 meters, a strategic change aimed at improving both efficiency and safety during booster catching and Starship stacking operations. According to the spaceflight community, the main reason behind this modification is to reduce dynamic load on the tower, increase catching precision, and improve control in high wind conditions. Shorter arms flex, less react, faster, and simply make the whole system safer. In fact, this new shorter chopstick design has already been implemented at both Pad 2 in Starbase and LC-39A in Florida, making it clear that SpaceX is moving toward a more standardized, refined Mechazilla setup across all sites. Now, speaking of Pad 2, SpaceX has really stepped up testing activity there lately, especially around the venting system and the water deluge setup. You can often see short venting bursts and small-scale water releases happening every few days. These tests are designed to make sure the system can safely and efficiently vent cryogenic gases, mainly liquid oxygen and liquid methane, from the storage tanks and plumbing lines without any blockages or unexpected pressure spikes. That might sound minor, but it's actually a critical part of launch safety. If the venting system doesn't work perfectly, pressure can build up inside the tanks, which could compromise the entire propellant loading process. So, SpaceX is carefully checking every component from valves and pipelines to each connection point to catch any potential weaknesses early on. And that's not all. Both booster quick disconnects at Pad 2 have been put through repeated testing just a few days ago. Those tests ran for hours. Typical SpaceX, extremely thorough. They're making sure each BQD can handle cryogenic pressure, reliably detach cleanly once fueling is complete, and respond precisely to automated commands. Now, here's something interesting, unlike Pad 1, which only had one BQD, Pad 2 has two. That's a major design improvement based on lessons learned from Pad 1. With two BQDs, SpaceX can fuel the booster much faster, which directly supports their long-term goal of rapid turnaround launches. So, yeah, all signs point to a busier 2026 with more frequent Starship missions than ever before. Those are the latest updates from Starbase Texas. Now, let's move over to Florida, where things are getting even more exciting. On November 4th, SpaceX reached a major milestone in the Starship program by transporting the brand new orbital launch mount from the Roberts Road facility to Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center, Florida. This event marks a crucial step toward preparing for Starship launches from the East Coast, part of SpaceX's broader effort to expand operations beyond Starbase Texas. The new OLM is designed to support the fully stacked Starship vehicle. Compared to the OLM at Starbase's pad, B, this version appears far more complete, with pre-installed methane manifolds, quick disconnect systems, and plumbing connections that should significantly shorten setup time at LC-39A. The transport was carried out using self-propelled modular transporters, similar to those used at Starbase, requiring tight coordination with NASA security to clear the road, especially given the OLM's enormous size towering over streetlights and nearly blocking the view of the vehicle assembly building from certain angles. By the following day, November 5th, the structure was already lifted and placed onto its foundation. Crews are now expected to secure the legs install propellant feed lines and integrate the mount with the control and water systems. 
With less than two months left in 2025, it remains uncertain whether SpaceX can complete the installation before year's end. The company aims to conduct the first launch from LC-39A by summer 2026, though several challenges remain, including the construction of a new tank farm and supporting infrastructure. For comparison, Starbase's Pad B OLM was transported nearly six months ago, but still lacks key components, whereas the LC-39A OLM looks more finalized, potentially shortening the timeline. Still, the Florida site has no complete tank farm yet, which could delay future operations, if not addressed soon. Meanwhile, SpaceX faces growing pressure from NASA to accelerate Starship's development, especially as the agency reconsiders its Artemis III strategy amid schedule concerns, a situation that could open the door for competitors like Blue Origin. So, yeah, while Starship is expected to launch from LC-39A in 2026, SpaceX is also building two new launch pads at Space Launch Complex 37. This makes it clear that SLC-37 will play a major role in SpaceX's long-term expansion in Florida, possibly on a scale even larger than LC-39A, and comparable to Pad 1 and Pad 2 at Starbase. In SpaceX's latest HLS update, the company even hinted that SLC-37 will serve as the primary site for future lunar missions, noting rendering of future Starship launch pads planned for Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Development is still in its early stages, so information remains limited. However, reports indicate that seven of the nine tower modules for one of the launch towers at SLC-37 have already been assembled, impressive progress considering construction only began in June, according to documents from the U.S. Space Force and SpaceX, the first Starship launch from SLC-37 is currently scheduled for 2026, with the site expected to support up to 76 launches per year.